Well, thank you, Howard, for being willing to be on the Shared Practices podcast. Uh, I owe you a lot in terms of my my career in dentistry and connections that I made between Dentaltown, giving me a job. I think I came and I, I begged Carrie Cruz for a job multiple times. And she was like, what are you doing? You're a dental student. Get out of here. And finally, I was able to convince her that that I was going to be able to telework and work for Dentaltown during my junior and senior year of, of uh, dental school. I was at Midwestern on the other side of the valley, and you let us come over. And, and basically, my goal was to, to expand the reach of Dentaltown to more dental students across the nation. And in the meantime, you started a, a podcast. You got it up and running with Jenna and some other people, and then Jenna quit. And, and I was afraid the podcast was going to die. So I was like, please, Howard, let me, let me take over this podcast. Let's, let's get it going. And we got to do this podcast together, your podcast, which is now out of control. It, you know, you're, you're, over, you're getting up to 500 pretty soon, aren't you? I think so. How many have we done, right? Yeah, you're right. Uh, and and I, I was holding you back because I wanted you to stay at three days a week. And you wanted to go five. You wanted to do video and everything that I was like kind of resistant on and everyone else was, was kind of resistant on, totally you were right in the end. Now that you've got video on Facebook and all these other things, it's, it's just crushing it. So between the townie meeting, the podcast, everything, I, just, I have to start off by thanking you, Howard, for, for giving me the chance to work for you, for having a blast, raising my vision, uh, kind of taking a risk on a, on a dental student who claimed to know what he was doing when when really I was I was learning on the job. So it was a lot of fun. Uh it was it was an honor and privilege to work with you and know you. I think the world of you. Well thank you, Aaron. That's not what I was going for, but you know No, no, I, do, I I think I mean you I mean you had it together in school, you had it together in marriage, you now got two kids. I mean you're just you're just the all of you're you're what I call the all American boy with an extra helping of apple pie. Uh, well so my goal today is to get some content out of you that you've shared a little bit of it before, and I want to get some new stuff out of you. Um, my podcast, what's different about mine versus kind of the other dental podcasts that are out there, I am trying to organize it into seasons. And each season is going to cover a topic of the business of dentistry, but it's going to go in order from graduation. Season one is going to cover how to get a job, how to evaluate associateships, how to expand the scope of your practice, and how to move towards practice ownership. So I believe that practice ownership is still one of the best ways for, for dentists to practice. And, you know, these corporate chains and all these things, they're doing a lot of good things and, and corporate, you know, we're all incorporated. But um, I think that my generation is afraid of practice ownership and is hesitant because of student loans and competition and all these other things, lifestyle to go into practice ownership. And so I, I want to move someone from graduation through this stage of, of looking for a practice, saving up, setting aside money, finding a practice, buying a practice, transforming the internal systems, marketing and growing. And so each season is going to focus on one of these topics. And so we're going to organize it topically. And you've been gracious enough um, that you said that I can – use little audio clips. If there was some interview you did on episode 75 that is about how to, how, which CE courses to take or, or how to interview for a job or how to market or whatever, that we can take a little clip from that and incorporate it into our podcast. And so I'm going to try and curate some of the best content from your podcast, from other podcasts, through interviews like this, and give a new graduate a journey to go from start to ownership, to growing and success, and do that through the course of the podcast. So starting with season one, you could talk intelligently about any of these topics. If, if you were to talk to a new grad, and you talk to new dentists all the time, you talk to dental students, you talk to new grads, what, were, what are the biggest concerns? What comes up? all the time when, when you talk with dental students and new grads? What are their concerns? Well, I think their number one concern is always their debt, which is comical. Uh, you know, 300, 400, 500, that, that's a lot of money to a baby who's 25. Uh, when you're a grandpa, you, know, you just chuckle. I mean, they're, 
there's not one of them that has three hundred fifty thousand dollars uh, student loan that's not going to live in a house someday that costs more than that, twice that, three times that, four times that. Uh, I always joke about, you know, your first divorce will cost you a million dollars. Right. You know, you think your $350,000 is a lot of money. Why don't you stay married for 10 years, build a million dollar practice, then get divorced, and you'd give anything for that settlement to be uh, <laughs> your um, stupid student loan amount. Um, you know, money is, um, money has a lot of emotional content to it because when you're little, uh, your mom and dads and grandmas and grandpas are saying all this thing about money, uh, so it gets all confusing. But money's bad when it's uh, when you go into debt and it's consumption it's for a house, a vacation, and cars. One of the slams I have against the young dental students is the slams I have about all banking credit. The problem in America is never can you get a loan. The problem is can you pay it back. I mean, they start giving you credit card applications when you're 12 years old and don't have a job or a lawnmower. Um, so. The problem, the reason student loan debt is so high is because they allowed you to borrow so much. I, I've been to Midwestern Dental School. I've been to AT still. I've seen the cars in the parking lot. I mean, I've seen the $30,000 Acuras, and I've seen, uh, um, I've seen spring break pictures on Facebook that people doing cruises in the Caribbean. This, this is stuff where I didn't have a car in my undergrad at Creighton. And I didn't have a car the first three years at uh, UMKC Dental School. I got a car senior year. Right. And uh, so, um, so your whole life, and, and that's my best marriage advice too. Whenever you get two savers that get married, their stress is so low, they go on cruise control. Whenever you have two spenders, uh, they're always out of control. They're always going back to their boss wanting a raise. They, they always have money problems. They have it at 25. They have them at 35, 45, 55. And, and you still see 60-year-old dentists uh, that go plop down and, and get a 30-year mortgage on a brand-new mansion. You're right. like, dude, you're 60 years old. Snap out of it, you know. So spending money will cause stress okay. in consumption. But when you're in business, other people's money is the only way you're going to get to the top. I like to use extreme examples like billionaires. So there's 1,860 billionaires. If you were born the same day Jesus was and made $10 an hour, 24 hours a day for 2,000 years and never spent a dime, you wouldn't have a billion dollars. Right. Um, so the only way to become a billionaire like 1,860 people have is you've got to borrow a, eight, a billion dollars of other people's money, whether that be debt, a bond, a bank loan, an IPO. Buy or build something, pay it back, and you have a billion. So debt is leverage in business, and, um, and you see that in, when they're buying a practice. Like you know, they'll, they'll, they'll be picking a practice, and they'll say, well, I want the little bitty $200,000 one. I don't want the midsize four hundred to 600000 one. I'm right. like, well, buy the million one. If you got three hundred fifty thousand student loans, uh, you got a wife, you got kids, you want to make bank, buy a big cash flow machine that spins out a lot of cash flow. So they have a lot of emotional distortions about money. Don't don't borrow other people's money for lifestyle. Borrow all you can and buy the biggest cash flow machine you can. Because if you buy that million dollar practice on a seven year loan and its its own cash flow is going to pay it back. In right. seven years, you own a million-dollar practice. Right. And you can't do that in Tanzania. You can't do that in Namibia. You know, you can only do that, get access to other people's money in about 20 countries. And you're just lucky to be an American that you can borrow a million dollars of other people's money, which go, go try doing that in Venezuela. Right. So it's, the debt is, is actually a huge favor that's being done to us in that we can borrow money – to make more money, to pay that money back at such a faster rate. And I think that's, that's what we don't get and that's what scares people in this good debt versus bad debt that you just outlined is that good debt allows you to produce more income. Bad debt is for consumption and lifestyle. So going to practice ownership, some of my generation is either delaying practice ownership or deciding they don't want to do that at all. Do you think that practice ownership is still worth it oh for my. The, the solo doc? Oh, my God. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I never want to throw court. My, you know, like you said, everybody's accountant is incorporated the dentist. So when dentists claim they're anti-corporate, it's like, dude, you have an LLC or a PC on your own dog. But what you and I mean by corporate is the, uh, the 350 um, big box chains that have more than 50 locations and they're all multi-state. Um, they're awesome at providing employment. You know what I mean? But those big chains, I don't want to mention names because, you know, it might get back to Heartland. But, you know, they're, they're going to take 
fourteen percent off the top. So so when you buy a practice, you, you got fourteen percent right there. I mean that that's what they're going to take right off the top. So so the bottom line is um. I, I think the most exciting thing about my career of 30 years is I never had a boss. Um, and I'm as against bosses as I am with partnerships because when you get married and have um, make love and have children and holidays and evenings, that's going to fail half the time. So now you're going to marry a dentist that you have no social glues with. You don't kiss, snuggle, make love, have children, go on family vacations together, have all these family and in-laws, and you think that's going to work? What I enjoyed the most of my entire career, uh, which is uh, 29 years, is that that's, that's the house according to Howard. I don't really care if anybody likes it or doesn't like it. I mean, um, you know, if, if someone works for me and they say, well, I just don't like anything about this, that's awesome. There's 2 million dentists on earth serving 7 billion people. We each get 3,500 patients. Go knock yourself out. Go do whatever you want. And I wouldn't trade that independence for anything in the world. I, I don't want a boss. I don't want to be driving to corporate wondering if I'm in trouble or if I'm late or if I want to take off two weeks or I want to shut down from Christmas to New Year's. I, I just want to be my own boss. I think that's worth so much money. Secondly, um, I don't know if I ever told you that story. Did I ever tell you a story about um, – and, and by the way, if I'm ranting too much, just feel no, free to, I, me to shut we'll, the hell up. We'll, I'll, I'll cut you off. I'm not afraid okay, to okay. shut you down, sir. And, and by the way, on um, when you're uh, cutting out snippets of the other podcasts or whatever, you ever want me to come back and add something to any of these other subjects, you can call me 24-7. I'd love to rant on all those subjects. Awesome. But there was, a, there was a lady, when I got out of school, I, that was in 87, I was 24 years old, and I came to town, and there was this like 85-year-old Jewish lady, and um, she was hiring associates, and I went and talked to her. She, she snuck out of Nazi Germany before it got too bad, and um, she came to America, and they, they told her that her German dental license didn't work, and she cried and cried and cried. They told her she had to go all, all through dental school again and all this, and she wasn't right. going to do that. She, could, she wasn't in the, in the position to do that. So it forced her just to own a dental office. And of course, so it forced her to spend all of her time working on the business and not spending all of her time working in the business. I mean, when mom and dad spend all their time making hamburgers, fries, and Cokes, they're never working on the marketing, the advertising, the new product, the overhead. And that's why corporate McDonald's killed all the mom and pop hamburger stores. That's why corporate um, does so well is because they have a whole team working on the business Whereas mom and dad are working in the business. And so by the time I caught up with her, she was like 85 and had like four offices that were doing two and a half million each year. She she was doing 10 million. And she told me that the worst thing that ever happened to her in her life, you know, I'm, you know, running out of Germany and coming here and her license doesn't work, turned out to be the biggest blessing in her life because it forced her. And that's another thing about corporate. If you work at corporate, it, imagine you graduate in dental school and they give you a lawnmower. You're going to be pushing that lawnmower 40 hours a week till you're 65. Right. But when you own your own business, you can hire an associate. You can hire somebody who sold their practice and just wanted to slow down. You could hire some young woman who says, you know, my husband's got a good job. I want to be a soccer mom, but I also want to be a dentist. I, I'm, going to, I'm going to get a, a soccer mom dentist who works uh, – uh, two days a week for me and some 60 year old dentist that retired and moved to this area uh, another two days a week. And, and that's another form of leverage. Like we talk about leverage. You knew you could have got a job at McDonald's for $8 an hour for 20 years and saved up and gone to dental school in cash because right. you're just against debt. But right. you knew it was smarter and you were lucky to be in a rich country like America where you could just borrow a half million dollars of other people's money, go through dental school, then pay it back while you're making $100 an hour. Right. And, and another form of leverage is you got to ask yourself, when I got my lawnmower, that was the coolest thing in the world. And I wanted to fix every tooth that came through the door. I love fillings, crowns, root canals. My favorite was always the toothache. That's where you feel like you're a fireman putting out a fire. You're a policeman catching the bad guy. When someone would come in and they were like in tears, in pain, couldn't sleep, damn. I, there was just nothing greater in life than that. I mean, that makes golf look completely insane. Uh, right. You know, it's just the greatest feeling. But I'm telling you, that greatest feeling might not be the greatest feeling 10 years later or 20 years later. Or 30 years there. Think of the favorite restaurant you ever went to. Uh, do you want to eat there every night for 10 years? Think no. of, think of your – that's why I don't own a cabin because 
I, you know, you go to a cabin, it's so fun, and so many people say, I'm going to buy a timeshare here. I'm like, God, the planet Earth is huge. I don't know if I want to go to the same cabin every deal. So the point I'm trying to make is that humans, it's so nice for leverage. It's so nice to own your office and say, you know what, I'm going to get another dentist or two in here, and I'm going to make uh, money off that. And you should be able to, like Heartland, Heartland makes 14% off the top of an office, if you get an associate and you pay them 25%, you should make 14% too. So if you build up a million dollar practice and you can make 14% of that without walking in the office, that's a that's $140,000 a year. You do a $2 million office. Now you're at 280, almost $300,000 a year and you haven't got out of bed yet. Right. So you would say practice, so just to summarize real quick, practice ownership is yes, still definitely worth it. Because not only the freedom it gives you to work for yourself, be your own boss, call the shots, leverage yourself with hygiene and other associates, keep the profit that would have gone elsewhere that you're pushing the lawnmower, you might as well keep all the profit as well instead of giving half that up to someone else. So you, sounds like resounding yes. You think practice ownership oh, is still worth yeah. it for the individual dentist. And it will still be here one million years from now. So, okay, so now – to get there, that's the next part of this. So you say yes, getting from graduation to practice ownership. There's a few people that I feel like walk straight out of dental school. They've got the confidence, the speed, the, the ability to produce. They can find the financing. I wouldn't say that's the majority. I would say that's definitely a minority coming straight out of dental school. And so most new grads are going to go work somewhere for some period of time before getting into their own practice, wherever that ends up being. So season one of this podcast, we're focusing on that little space of time between dental school and owning your practice. You've seen this from both end, dentists who are looking for a job and are, you know, saying, oh, you know, I, I worked at this office and that office and it was horrible and, and I'm just trying to find a good job. You've also seen it from the end of you own a practice and you hire associates all the time to work in that practice since basically since you've been practicing dentistry, you've almost always had an associate as far as I understand. Yeah. And so looking at this from two sides, from being the business owner and the, the owner doc who has to hire associates and also from guys going out and trying to find associateships, how should someone go about finding a good job to take them from graduation to set them up to go into practice ownership rather than a job that kind of traps them or distracts them from practice ownership. How do they find the job? How do they stand out versus other applicants? And then how do they know when they're ready to move on? And you're, you're the king of asking compound questions to your, your podcast. <laughs> yes. So I wanted to do the same thing to you. So I, I, I would say that the, the best time to open your practice is straight out of school. I mean, you, you, you can walk around the swimming pool for five years and reading books on how to swim and all that stuff. But when your old man throws you in the swimming pool, you're going to drown or learn how to swim. So I think that it, it's the same thing with having kids. Like, I love it when I saw you already have two kids because if you got 30 years old or 35 years old or 40 years old and when you're all ready to have kids, you'd look at that decision like, that's crazy to have kids. They could be crazy. There'll be a lot of money. They could be nuts. I mean, it, the, having a child is so irrational. The best time to have it is before you think about it. Just get them <laughs> before out. Before you've realized how irrational it is. Oh, my God. Not only are they going to – I mean, they're, they're going to be the hardest job you ever love, and it's complete. And, and, and when people have delayed marriage, you know, at the end of World War II, there was about 16. Now it's all the way up to about 26. And if you think about it for 10 years, a quarter of, uh, of baby boomers did not have a child because um, they thought about it long enough to think that is a batshit crazy idea because your kid could be uh, sick. He could be crazy. He could be – he's going to be expensive. He's going to take okay, all I'm, the time. I'm cutting you off. I'm bringing you back. So you told me that if you ever go off, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut you off and bring you back. So you were going on a good rant. Question is, you, sounds like you recommend sooner rather than later. Day one, just walk out of school and dive in head first. If okay. You, any year you spend thinking about it, you just wasted a year. So just do it. Just, just band do it. Just do Absolutely. it. Absolutely. And, and the younger you are, the more energy you have. Sure, you'll be scared. That's good. When I see four hungry, starving coyotes, something's going to die and get eaten. Okay. <laughs> I would rather have, I'd rather bank my money 
on a young kid, tons of energy, scared to death, doesn't know what you know if he's going to make it. Oh my God, he'll make it every single time. Right. I, I, I I would not bet on the kid who thought about it for ten years. No, and and um, Jason Wood, I interviewed him the other day, and he actually said that he's seen that if someone goes seven years as an associate. They will likely never open their own absolutely. or own their own practice. Or have a kid. That's what my analogy was. <laughs> right. No, yeah, th- absolutely. Think about children for seven years and you'll give yourself a vasectomy. Right. Okay, so you say do it straight out of school. Now let's let's assume that someone just isn't ballsy enough to do that. They don't have the confidence. They you know, they wanna get better. Let's say they are gonna go out and find an associateship. How does someone find a good associateship? Because there's so many bad ones. How do you find a good one and do they exist? Well, I would I would uh, first find out um, I would first find what are you looking for? Like, if you want to own your practice and you want to learn HR and business and leadership and all that, I'd go find some office where he's kept his wife, he's kept his staff, he's kept his patients, and yeah, you're doing fillings and crowns over here, but you're watching how a well-run business is being ran. That's another reason I like it when people go work at some of the very successful corporate chains like Heartland and Pacific Dental. I mean, these are wor- these are, those are the cream of the crop. I mean, that's like Batman and Robin in corporate dentistry. And you could be literally looking at all their systems, all their everything. I mean, you could be, every time you could go home and just write a diary, you could literally walk out with the forms. I mean, you could just sit there and say, I'm, if Rick Workman is running 1,500 offices, I'm gonna learn everything he's doing to run my one. If Steve Thorne, is running 500 Pacific Dental Cares. You know, that guy's got enough systems to run 500 and you're trying to run one. So I would go to a million dollar practice or a corporate to look at that. A lot of kids walk out of school and they say, you know, I didn't place one implant. And they want to go get a job at at an implant center. Uh, Some of the biggest gold mines I ever saw in my life um, was the people who um, bought an old Denture World clinic, you know, some $300,000 dive in the poorest part of town where all the seniors are living in trailers and they um, went and learned implants. And now when all these grandmas and grandpas are coming in for a reline, they place implants. I know guys that went and worked in some of the worst facility denture mills for the lowest wages ever, but they were placing 50 implants a month right. and just thought that was just, that was so incredibly awesome. Uh, maybe you got out of school and you want to be a cosmetic dentist, but in school you never did one Invisalign case. So now you went and found a job and they're not very busy and they're in a rich part of North Scottsdale or Beverly Hills and you're hardly getting any patients, you're hardly making any money, but you're watching someone who's a cosmetic dentist and you're learning Invisalign and you're learning smile design and you're learning uh, how to be a cosmetic dentist. So I would say I would say the biggest mistake dentists make is they, they look at just the money. Well, this right. one's going to pay me 25%. This one's going to pay me 28%. This one will pay half my lab bill. This one has to pay the whole lab bill. And then they walk into some guy, he's on his fifth wife, no staff's been there two years, it's batshit crazy, and then they're all stressed out. And every, every time they hate their associate's job, I'm like, dude, you went out and looked for that job. Right, you found your, that. Your best idea was to work here. Right. What were you looking for? And the other thing is on, on the classified ads on Dentaltown, you know, there's, uh, there's 6,000 free classified ads that expire after 90 days. Um, and I've also seen a lot of kids just start a thread on Dentaltown and said, hey, I'm looking for a job. They just go right to practice and say, I'm a, I'm a kid. I'm looking for a job. And here's, and here's another thing. Um, nobody wants to hire a kid out of school because we think you've only done three fillings and two crowns. Right. What really sells the dentist is when you walk in there with confidence and sell yourself. I mean, don't, don't call up. Don't get on the website. Press the flesh. You're running for mayor. Show up. Shake hands. And shake hands, you know, and how do you shake hands with the receptionist, the assistant, the hygienist? It's like how many times I've been to dinner with a, with a failing dental office practice, and he's being all nice and loving to me and treating me like world class, but then he treats the waiter like shit. Right. So then you know, well, that's how you treat your assistant, your hygienist. That's how you treat your patients. I mean, I have more respect for the guy who treats the waiter better than me. And so go in there, win over the whole team. If the assistant and the hygienist and the office manager say, God, I love that kid. And the right. dentist is thinking, well, he's only done one filling and two crowns. Um, you, you'll just work your way in. So for you, when you're hiring, when you're interviewing and looking at applicants, um, what are the things you're looking for? What are your qualifications that you require? 
And, and what are some examples of like bad applicants that you've gotten and really good ones? Like what's the worst applicant you've ever gotten without naming names and what's the best applicant you've ever gotten as a, as a practice owner? It's 100%. We hire on attitude. We'll train the skill. Does, does the assistants like you? Do the hygiene? We are just looking for chemistry. You know, if, if everything was analytical, your GPA, your residency, Match.com would have an algorithm and 30 million people be married tomorrow. It's right. all chemistry. It's all attitude. Um, you know, do you like – do you want to play with this person in the sandbox? And it's the same thing as dental schools. Dental schools are mostly worried about – I don't want to hang out with this guy for four years. I don't want him to be, I don't want to be his teacher. I don't want to be his mentor. I don't want, you know, they're looking for so when they're doing the interview, oh, sure, they're supposed to be looking at DAT scores and all this stuff. They're mostly looking at, do I want to hang out with you for four years? Do you make right. me smile? When I'm driving to work, do I want to be thinking, I wonder what, you know, you did this weekend. I wonder what's up with you. I mean, they, they just chemistry. Go in there. It, it's the same thing with marketing. Uh, all this marketing stuff is all like a resume. It's all this analytical stuff that doesn't work. When I opened up my dental office, I got a big map of Ahwatukee. Uh, it was in 1987. There were 25,000 people living in about 8,000 homes. And on every Saturday, I walked door to door, knocked on every door, gave him a balloon, a toothbrush, my name on it, said, hey, I'm Howard Ferran. I'm practicing up there by Safeway. I'm 25 years old. I got that right out of the way. I'm going to be here till I'm 65, and I just thought I'd get out there and meet the neighborhood. And and two houses were like weirded out, and every third one was just <laughs> big old smile, like you know I need a dentist. And he's showing me his tooth while he's wearing right. his underwear and his, his you know and 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 I mean just run for mayor. Do you think have you ever heard anyone else actually doing that? Because I mean going door to door right around your practice is brilliant, but like I think most guys would 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 look at that in bulk and say, oh, I'm not a door to door salesman. Well, well they, they, they'll sit there and say, well, no one wants to go to me because I'm 25. I went out and knocked on their door, and I told them I was 25. I said, you know, I'm 25 years old. I just right. opened up by Safeway, and I'm going to be here till I'm 65, right. and I just want to get out and meet the neighborhood. And my God, awesome. I mean, I would do that all day Saturday and Sunday. And a lot of people say, well, you know, I, you know, I need to make an appointment coming and see you. And I'd reach in my backpack, well, here's my appointment book. I have no patients <laughs> scheduled till the end of time. What would be the best time for you to come in? And they'd say, well, I get off work tomorrow at 3. How about at 3 o'clock? And I would not stop on Sunday until I had an hour and a half scheduled for every new patient coming in. And I did every one of them door to door. It took me six months to knock on every door. So Monday through Friday for six months was filled with hour and a half, new patient appointments, x-rays, exam, cleaning, whatever. I didn't understand gum disease. I was slow. My fillings took forever. But I just was having fun. I was running for mayor. I was pressing the flush. It was uh, we, we crushed it. That's awesome. So someone who's looking for a job, for an associateship, they need to look for something that's going to expand their skill set, teach them business skills. They need to be purposeful about looking at relationships and how they mesh and fit with the practice and how that doc treats his staff and how he treats people that he's around. And then... If you're going to go interview for these jobs, don't just kind of pull out your numbers and say, hey, I'm good because of this, that, and the other. It's, it's got to be a fit, and it goes both ways. When you're interviewing for this job, if someone doesn't like Howard's strong personality, then they know they're not going to be a good fit for the practice because they're going to have to be there every day with you. And, so, and if they love you and they're just as loud and, and can bounce things right back at you, then, then they're going to have a blast. So that would be your advice summed up for, for looking for an associateship. Anything else to add on that? Yeah, do something you love and you'll never work another day in your life and never, ever pay people money that you don't want to play with. Don't give people money because it adds your stress, you're unhappy, you're miserable. Uh, same thing with dentists. A lot of dentists are doing procedures that they hate. If you do something you hate for money for 10, 20, 30 years, you're going to get depressed, start drinking, eating Vicodin. You know, just play. Have fun. Go. Pick the people that you want to play with. Do the procedures that are fun. Um, when people say to me, do, I, do should I buy a CAD CAM? Well, I, I think a CAD CAM is $150,000. It's way too much money, you know, blah, 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 blah. Right. But if you think it's the coolest thing in the world, then you have to have your little toy in the sandbox. If, if it takes a Tonka trunk, a laser, a CAD CAM, whatever makes you run 20 red lights on the way to work, is the people you got to have, the procedures you're doing, the technology you're doing. And I was also uh, infamous for firing patients. 
I mean, when people would come in there and scream and yell and I saw my assistant all rattled everything, I'd always just say, you know what, buddy, get your ass out of here right now or I'm calling 911. I did that every year for 30 years. you got to protect your staff and your sanity and, and it's got to get rid of the ones that aren't worth it. The customer doesn't come first, your staff comes first, and if you're all happy and playing, they're going to treat your customers good, and the minute some staff, some customers start treating your staff bad and ruining their day, you're ruining everybody's day, just have fun, have chemistry, and, and to sit around and look, well, I have $350,000 student loans, and this practice is 800000 and start looking at all the accounting stuff, you're not going to make it or break it on an accounting spreadsheet. You're going to make it or break it because you are happy with a loving team and having fun and wanting to go there every day. And then the next day, you know, you blink and you're a grandpa. Okay. So you mentioned having fun and you specifically talked a, a little bit and you've, you've mentioned this several times, the kind of procedures and technology you want to be using. And that's another theme that we want to dive into in season one of, of our podcast is the idea that expanding the scope of your practice is one of the best things you can do for your happiness income, sanity, enjoyment, love of dentistry long term, but it's going to take purposeful effort and investment to expand the scope of your practice. So how do you go about deciding what procedures to learn if you're a new grad, you know, and you're like, I, I know how to do fillings and crowns and I can prove that on the boards, but, but what else should I learn how to do? How do you decide what you're going to learn? And once you decide what you want to learn and what procedures you want to move forward with, how, how do you choose which CE courses to go to and, and, and expanding the scope of your practice? I want to hear your thoughts on this. Well, you know, as far as, let, let's go to CE. I, I, I think dentists, there, there's two types of dentists. I just want to cut them all in half. There's street smart and there's book smart. And the book smart are looking at these quality institutions and flying across the country and dropping $5,000 on a weekend. And then there was me, street smart, grew up with nothing in, in Wichita, and I would just go to the oral surgeon and say, I want to learn about pulling wisdom teeth. And everybody, again, I'm running for mayor. You go in there, you're a young kid, you're smiling, say, you know, when I pull the tooth, I can only get the top half off. I can never get the root out. And and they would, you know, Don Gas, come watch me. Uh, you know, all these, all these dentists... Um, I want to learn implants, less fish. We'll come down and, you know, we'll place some. And we put some in this lady uh, named Doris and, and um, you know, root canals. I mean, the greatest endodontist in my town was up by your school, Glendale, um, uh, Brad Gettleman. Okay. And Brad Gettleman, you could just go up. To, anybody could go up there and pull up a chair. I'd rather, rather for free for the price of gas. And I'd even offer, well, I'll buy you lunch. They didn't even want lunch. They would sit there at their lunch hour and just yak for another hour. People like people. They like chemistry. They like friends. And, you know, it's a faster day at the office when you're spending the day doing these root canals, shooting the shit with some young kid next to you and learning and learning. You could learn every procedure, the most advanced, without spending a dime um, just going to the guy across the street. And then the specialists want to meet you. But see, a lot of people think that everybody thinks in fear and scarcity. Like, well, if I show you how to pull a wisdom tooth, you'll never, you'll never refer to me. The truth of the matter is you got to think in hope, growth, and abundancy. And the oral surgeon is sitting there thinking, I'd rather you be my buddy. And I didn't know you before. Now you're my buddy. So now you go back and pull, say, 80% of your wisdom teeth. Well, guess who's going to get the other 20% of the wisdom teeth out of all the oral surgeons in the Phoenix Valley? You know, there's... 4 million people and 3,800 dentists, but now you're my buddy. And that's how the healthy functional endodontist things, periodontist, pediatric dentist, orthodontist, the orthodontist that if you walk in there and you say, well, I want to learn Invisalign, you know, the dumbest of the dumb orthodontists saying, oh my God, you know, then you should go to ortho school and, and get out of here and you're the devil, you're Lucifer, run. The smart ones are sitting there thinking, I'll show you everything. I want to be your buddy because most general dentists that get into any any procedure, after five or ten years, kind of get bored, lose interest. And they say, you know, I did I did a hundred ortho cases, but I, my time's better spent doing crown and bridge or endo, or they did endo, or the, you know. So you're moving all around for forty years, and if you get hot and heavy into ortho, and some orthodontist there, I'll give you an example. I don't want to mention names because. It'll get back to Craig Steichen in Albuquerque, New Mexico. He got all hot and heavy in ortho. And then after about two or three or four years, he decided, I don't want to do any ortho. So he goes to the other orthodontists. Now, you know, everybody's treating him like he has the plague. And one orthodontist says, you know what? I'll take every orthodontic patient you have, 
and I'll finish every damn one of them if I get all your ortho referrals. But dude, that was 30 years ago. That orthodontist has probably made gazillions, not to mention has a great friend, Craig Steichen. So, so learn CE, learn a buddy. Also, that buddy will help bail you out. Um, you know, that you, you and, have- and that's the other thing. I, I feel like a lot of new dentists who are looking to expand into endo or, or some other procedure, they're worried about what's going to happen if they get stuck and or they have a bad outcome or they have a patient that maybe they didn't set the expectations of the patient that hey I'm I'm learning this this is something that you know if if we get stuck we're going to send you over to the I'm going to take you over to the to the specialist and if you have a relationship with this specialist you've been over there and they know what you're trying to learn and they know that you're not perfect but you're you're trying to do what's best for the patient then they're not going to be pissed at you when you call them and then maybe they still will be if it screws up their schedule, but it'll be in a friendly, you know, giving you a little bit of a hard time, but still helping you out type, type of way. You know, I notice in Phoenix, half the dentists think in fear and scarcity in every other dentist competition. The other half think in hope, growth, and abundance. I, I saw that in Ahwatukee. You know, half the dentists, yeah, you want to go meet too, just you're totally stone cold and you were competent. The other half were like, come on in, come to my house, all charcoal, let's right. make dinner. And now, 30 years later, the ones that had the attitude, the chemistry, the hope, growth, and abundance, they had the most successful in finance and happiness. And see, I mean, there's, there's dentists I do secondary opinions on where, where it's my buddy and the patient's all upset, and I'll just fix it right there. I'll right. say, well, I, I had one guy coming into me saying he was going fa- to sue this guy oh boy. Um, who one mile up the street from me, and um, he placed an implant, blah, 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 blah. And I said, well, I'll tell you what. I'll take out the failing implant. I'll, re- I'll do the whole damn thing as long as you don't sue my buddy because I think he's one of the best dentists in all of Phoenix. And the guy looked at me like, are you serious? And I did the whole thing, and I never told him. I just really? you know, I never told him, and it took him like five years to figure it out. Then one day he got a phone call. He goes, dude, did you really blah, blah? And that's the way Tom Matterns bailed me out. I mean, we, you know, they're, they're your friends, and that's right. – Think in hope, growth, and abundance because the fear should be against the $800 iPhone, the trip to Disneyland, the wanting to take your kids to Europe and the clothes and the cars and the boats and the jet skis. It's not oral health. I mean go to any woman in America and say, how much money would I have to give you to pull your front tooth and you never replace it? They'd say, no way. I'd say, well, what about $100,000 cash? No way. No. The, these girls that walk out of dental school complain they got $350,000 in student loans. I'll walk up to anyone and say, I'll pull your, I'll give you $350,000, but you got to give me your number eight incisor and never replace never it. Never get it back. And, that, and now she screams and runs away. It's like, well, how bad is $350,000 if you won't even give me one tooth? And that's dentistry. Right. Dentistry is going to be here a million years now because the dentistry – healthcare was z- one, 1% of the GDP in 1900. One century later, 2000, it was 14% of GDP. We're only 16 years into the new century, and it's 17% of GDP. And anybody who thinks that we spend too much in healthcare, well, we'll think it out. Once you have robots making all the phones, cars, mowing your lawn, you have everything, and you have a million dollars, and they say, hey, Richard, uh, your right eye uh, just fell out. What, what do you want to do? You say, well, I, I want my eye back. Right. They go, well, you got a lot of money in the bank. Give me all your money or leave here with only one eye. You're going to say, take all my money. And that's the way healthcare is. So, healthcare, you got a 117 year trend line that's only going one direction. And I'm the first one to tell you if you think healthcare is coming down, you're completely insane. It's at 17% now, it's going to 25, it's going to 35. And it would not shock me at all in 1,000 years if it took half the money. Because you have two kids right now. If you had all the money in China and one of your babies was going to die, and they said, oh, well, you could go to Scandinavia and give this doctor everything you've got the house, the car, all your money. And he'll give them a little blue pill and your baby don't die. What would in you have to say? In a heartbeat. Yeah. So, healthcare, so, so, so invest in healthcare. I mean you're not selling red widgets. You're not selling computer mouses. You're not, I mean you're selling dental health and nobody's going to have mental health if their eyes, ears, nose, and teeth fall out. So you're in the right sector. So going back to CE and learning. So – I, the first thing that you would recommend if anyone's trying to learn a new procedure is reach out to all of your local specialists and see if you can come shadow them, if you can talk with them at lunch, you know, whatever you need to do to get over there 
and, and learn what they're doing, build a relationship with them, learn from them firsthand, and then you've got an automatic mentor that can help you when you get stuck, is there locally, is not charging you a bazillion dollars to fly across, across the country. So let's say that someone tries that. They, they reach out to their specialist. They all have scarcity mindsets. And they're, you know, they don't have the whole Valley of Phoenix to go you know, look for the next one. So now what's the next step if I still want to learn endo or I still want to learn implants? Where would you go next okay, that to, is, that is to look for CE? That is a world-class excellent question. Um, take, Car- Char- uh, um, take Carl Misch. Okay. Probably the greatest implantologist of, of all time. You know, um, um, Brandmark discovered it, but Misch is the one. I mean, he's the man. He's written a textbook. And he's updated it like seven or eight editions. And you read that book, it would, you know, it would fry your mind. It'd be upside down, and you'd know everything there was about implants. But that's not what people want to do. They want to go to the Mish Institute, where it's seven three-day weekends at three grand a weekend. And then I went, I read the book. Then I read again. Then I went to the course, and I was amazed at how every damn question that was asked for the entire time, I'm just sitting there thinking, dude, that's page 29. How, you didn't even read the first chapter of his book? And, and by going to the course, all I wanted to see is Beethoven play the piano. I wanted to see the, the hands lights, but to learn anything didactic in endo, perio, pedo, pros, anything, the textbooks are 100 or 200 bucks. And it's the complete Wikipedia of the deal. After that, if you want to see something visual, look at Dentaltown. We have 400 online courses that are the, what, what's the price of our average course? Like 12, 18, 30 yeah, 15 bucks. to 30 bucks. You couldn't the, the, when you go to an institute for 3,000 a weekend, you couldn't even get a cab from the airport to your hotel room for the price of the online Dentaltown CE. Street smart people first go to the free guy across the street, then they go to the textbook. Then they could do online CE, and the ones who were graduating with $30,000 Japanese cars and taking cruises on their spring breaks and, and walking out 350 they're the ones that are flying to, you know, and I'm going to, all these guys will hate me when I say it, uh, you know, they're the ones going to $3,000 weekend courses at Coise and Spear and Panky sure. and all these places, and then they'll come back and I'll say, you just spent an entire week at the Panky Institute, dropped five grand Give me your notes. And I'm like, well, you know, you should have canine guidance and you should have canine discipline. I'm like, <laughs> dude, you could have watched. I mean, really? You dropped five grand and you're showing me three pages of notes? That's not street smart. Well, and, and I think one of the things is that we want to pay to, to have some expert tell us something. But whether we would actually learn that or not is a completely different issue. And, and kind of the going through dental school, it's the same thing that – You've paid three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars for this school, but what you got out of it really came down to what you put into it, and and how much you were in the lab and uh, in you know, treating patients and and studying the actual material. So, well, I'll, I'll just say a full their money will soon be parted every single time. It don't matter if they're in dental school, don't matter if they're in law school, med school, doesn't matter if they're president of the United States. Some people just can't keep anything money. I mean, dentists it seems like every time they get an idea. Their overhead goes up and they, they go bankrupt. They're like, well, I want to learn occlusion. So I'm going to fly to and pay 4000 bucks for a weekend course. Um, they'll sit there and say, well, you know what? I'm taking this $18 impression and the, and the lab is making the crown for $99. I know. I'll buy a $30,000 intraoral scanner from Denmark, and, 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 and every time they get an idea, and then, and then I'll mill it out chair side. There's another 150. I mean, every time they have a thought, well, you know, I used to do phrenectomies with a razor blade scalpel that costs a dollar, mm-hmm. and I'm going to replace it with a $100,000 laser, and I've never even done a phrenectomy. So you right. just spent a $100,000 laser to save you a $1 scalpel blade on a phrenectomy you've never done. I mean, if every time you have an idea... It costs you money and your overhead goes up. You need a business partner. Hopefully it's your spouse. You need an office. You need someone because I'll tell you this. Here, here's, my, here's my parting shot on overhead. Um, successful people say no a lot. Millionaires, about the only thing they say is no. Right. No, And, and that's why you've got your team at Dentaltown is to keep yeah. you in check. Yeah. So um, – I, I, I like this. We put together, and, and I'm going to add another piece that you said earlier. If you want to ex- expand the scope of your practice, one thing we talked about earlier that I didn't mention again was first find a job where you can learn that on the job 
because this office is doing a ton of Invisalign or it's already doing a ton of implants. So find a job where you can learn it or find a specialist locally that you can shadow and learn from. Buy the actual textbook and actually read it and open it up. And, and <laughs> what the heck? They, do you know what you could do? Um, if you're a new, new doc who wants to really learn something, Buy that textbook and then turn around and create a course for Dental Town on that subject in that chapter. And the the process of teaching it to someone else and putting it in a presentation, even if even if you don't actually upload it or send it to Howard or send it to Dental Town, that process of taking that chapter in the textbook and looking up resources and putting it into a presentation, you're going to learn that way better than if you paid three thousand dollars to go to some weekend course. And then um, the let me think, what was the last part of that? And then go on Dental Town. And, and look at the CE lectures and, and the different things on there. The last thing that I would recommend, and, and I'm sure you know, I've gotten this from you and from Dentaltown, would be to work up your patients that you currently have in your office, either the x-rays or the procedure that you're doing, that you're learning. Take pictures, get the x-rays, post it on Dentaltown, and, and get feedback. And so... That is instant mentorship from thousands and thousands and thousands of, of dentists that you're going to get a ton of perspectives. Some of them are going to be good. Some of them are going to be maybe you don't agree with, and that's fine. But your eyes are going to be opened up to things that you're not seeing. So if you want to learn how to do implants, do all those steps, and then you don't even have to place any implants at first. Just work up some cases that you've got patients in your office with, with mi- missing spaces and say, I'm thinking about placing an implant here and take pictures, maybe take some models, take the x-rays, post those on Dentaltown and say, should I place this here? Would this be a good first implant for me to place? And you're going to get a ton of responses. Have you seen people doing that successfully on Dentaltown, kind of expanding their scope of practice? I think success is always counterintuitive. You know, the the, the number one richest stockbroker in all of Wall Street is Warren Buffett, who lives in Omaha, Nebraska, and he does not want to live in Manhattan he doesn't want to get caught up in all that misinformation, and success is extremely counterintuitive, and I guarantee you um, everybody is hardwired to be a social animal, and they're, they're program. I got to get along. You know, the reason we smile and do all this stuff in Sharks Don't is because monkeys need each other to live and hunt, and we have to work collectively. A shark is, doesn't need anybody, so it doesn't smile, kiss, have friends, hold hands, none of that stuff like that, and so every, you know, there's 211,000 Americans alive today that have a dental degree, and they all worried about whatever everyone else is thinking about it. How could anybody think about 211,000 other people? Monkeys are always busy worrying about their problem, their friend, what's their patient, and the successful people, every fork in the road, like, okay, I want to get an associate job, and I'm in Salina, Kansas. There's only two guys, and, and they log on to Dentaltown, and they say, hi, I'm Howard. Here's the two guys. One guy said this. One guy said that. You did that for free, and now a community of people are all beating down the doors, tearing up the contracts, telling you all this thought, and it didn't cost you a penny. And you know why no one else does it? Is because they're all afraid what someone will think. And then that person, after he's worked there for a year, wants to buy a practice. There's three for sale. And he lists all three of them. And everybody tells you for free what to do. It's the same with root canals, implants. So quit thinking about what people are thinking about you because right now nobody's thinking about you. How many people are in the shower right now washing their armpit thinking, I wonder what Howard Friend's thinking right now? Or I wonder, you know, nobody's thinking about you. So why do you spend your whole life worrying about what everybody's thinking about? Before you walked on this show, you were looking at two babies, your lovely wife, your whole day plan. There wasn't one dentist from here to China that you were thinking about. Right. So get on Dental Town, be transparent. It's counterintuitive and it's zero cost. You'll make decisions faster, easier, higher quality for no cost. But I know what you'll do. You'll say, oh no, I know a $500 an hour consultant I'll call. Because every time you have a thought, that, that, that your money's gone because a fool in their money will soon part. Awesome. So that would be the last step. And, and you just addressed the reason that people don't do that. They don't post on dental town. They don't share their cases. They don't work up treatment plans and put them out there because they're afraid. They're afraid of what people are thinking, but no one really cares. And everyone understands that you have to start somewhere and that you have to, to learn somehow. And so I just started a residency here in the Army, and yesterday was our, our first treatment planning board, and we put together our cases and, and our treatment plans for these big, complex cases, and I just got torn apart. 
But because I got torn apart, I learned a ton. And now there's a ton more things that I specifically want to go in and investigate. I'm like, oh, I didn't realize I should have been thinking about this, that, and the other. It's the same thing on, on Dental Town. Both the positive feedback, if you only got positive feedback of like, oh, that's great, let's go ahead, you would never learn anything. So you need to post on there not caring because you, you think that someone else is going to think bad of you, but also looking to find the holes in your thinking. They have knowledge that you don't have. And even if they don't cushion it in this perfect little friendly, you know, oh, here, maybe you could consider thinking about this. You know, even if they come out and say it a little bit more blunt, that's perfect. That's what you need if you're going to get better. You have to get feedback. And sometimes it hurts. And sometimes it's a little bit embarrassing. But that's the only way you're going to grow. And if, and if you only do things that are comfortable, you're never, you're never going to get better. You're never going to, you're never going to expand your boundaries and, and, and move further. So that was a perfect little, okay, if I didn't want to spend $100,000 going to, you know, seminars and consultants and all this stuff to learn these different procedures, I can do it through this set way of looking for jobs where you're going to learn things on the job, looking for specialists who will share, reading textbooks, going on dental town, posting on dental town your cases. You can teach yourself a whole curriculum of whatever procedure you'd want. And of course, you're still going to have bumps along the way. You're still going to get stuck. You might get burned out. You might get frustrated. You might realize that there's some hands-on course that's actually going to let you do something and give you feedback that's worth attending. But, but you're going to have such a better framework going into that course rather than just jumping in and paying the money. So the last topic that I wanted to get you on, Howard, before, before I let you go, practice ownership, expanding the scope of your practice. I think these are two of the biggest ways that you can have success long-term, happiness long-term, make more money long-term. The last one would be to go where you're needed. And, you know, the, the dentist who wants to, to go to some major metro versus going out to the country or only wants to practice in a certain area, but at the same time is worried about paying down their student loans. Temporarily, going somewhere that maybe is a little bit more rural, do you think that could help them out in any sort of way? Well, I want to I an answer that. And one other question before that is um, when I see dentists go buy, buy a practice, whether it be in big city or not, where I have seen, and in 30 years, I've seen about 80 where they just completely screwed up. They, they bought some high-end practice that was doing a lot of cosmetic work, full mouth rehab. They didn't have any of the skills. They bought a million dollar practice and they drove it to 400,000 the first year. So they, mm -hmm. uh, so they, they just, uh, they ruined it. They overpaid. They thought about bankruptcy for years and years and years. Whereas the other side of that is they went and found a 75 year old dentist that all he did was amalgams and he had this little three chairs and he was just patching everything for years. And they bought that little practice for 300,000. And then every single day for the next 30 years, four a big old MOD BL amalgams would break and they'd do a thousand dollar crown chairs. I just numb it, prep it, pack the cord. And he was doing four $1,000 crowns a day for the next 30 years on a practice he bought for 300. So don't buy anything that you can't do. You know, make sure, look for value. Okay, so that's, that's significant. I'm going to go back to that because I just want to make a point of this. The only time that it's really scary to buy a dental practice, and maybe you shouldn't, because this is huge. You, you want to know, people want to know what, what's the risk of buying a dental practice. And the biggest risk is buying a dental practice that's doing things that you can't do. And therefore, you've paid for a practice producing this when you know a million when you can only produce six hundred thousand because you're not doing the procedures that the practice was doing. So to hear you say that that the only practices or the main practices that you've seen fail in your years of doing dentistry and dental town and knowing people have been in that situation, that's a huge red flag and a nugget that I think a lot of people. And the, and the reverse of that is, oh, I'm gonna, here's an office for 750 and he's doing it's all, doing all this. Crown and Bridge, and he refers out all of his endo, and I can buy this, and just adding endo to the practice will pay all my student loan payments and my practice debt payment. You want to go in and add value. You don't want to go in there and say, you're not valuable enough. You bought, doctor, all that, and you don't have those skills, whereas you want to buy some guy who says, wow, he's doing these numbers. And he refers out all of his pediatric dentistry, all of his endo, he does, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I can go in there 
and do the, the molar root canals or, or whatever. You want to go there and add value. That is the most important thing because business in three words is supply and demand. So, you know, what is the demand in your office? Like a lot of dentists will say to me, well, do you think I should learn how to place implants? Well, dude, you've been in this practice for 10 years. How many implants could you have placed each month if you knew that skill set today? Because if nobody's, if you couldn't sell any implants in your practice today, why learn that skill set? You should learn a skill set for what the patient's in there. So I want to go in there and say, okay, what are the staff? What, how long they've been there? What kind of relationships do, 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 do they trust in the community? And then what are these people coming in for? And then you want to sit there and find a population that's uh, that demanding something you can supply, mm -hmm. but the price is set because he didn't figure in the fact that all the referring endo is not on the production. All the referring pediatric dentistry or Invisalign or s some other skill set. And where it's going to be a disaster is when you were supposed to go in there and do $200,000 a year in uh, in Invisalign, and you right. don't even know Invisalign or, or something like that. So then well, with demographics, it's the same thing, your original it, question. Well, and you, you actually just answered another question that we brought up a long time ago, which was how do you decide what procedures you should learn? And that the answer is to look at your patient base and see what is it that we're referring out and that they want that we could be doing. And the, So the consultant's going to say, well, well, Dr. Harry did $750,000 a year. Okay, that's a, a very important number. I want to know how many hundreds of thousands he referred out and what was he referring out. How mm -hmm. many slips a week did he give to an endodontist, periodontist, prosthodontist, oral surgeon? And, and you got to like what you like. Like, you know, my, my number one procedure was always wisdom teeth. So I, I could buy a practice for 500000 If he referred out 100000 of Wizzies a year, I just bought a $600,000 practice, but it's only showing 500000 on the books. And uh, so – and and that's another thing you should look for in your associate. I mean – um, um, another thing you might do on your associate is let's say you get a job and it's four days a week, but there's an endodontist who'll let you come sit by him every damn Friday. I mean, how cool would that be? Right. No, so, so, so then, so then when we look at demographics, I mean, it's nobody, I mean, it's the biggest joke in all of healthcare and law professionals that, you know, you've never gone to a corner and seen 35 McDonald's in a building, but right. I can take you to 6,200 South McClintock. And there's 30 dentists in one building. And when you drive by the building, you don't even know it's a dental building. I mean, it's just completely, completely crazy, okay? Uh, so you need to know the dentist for 1,000. Now, there's a couple of ways you can do this without any work. You can call the insurance companies. Insurance like Delta is selling insurance to people that employ people throughout the whole state, policemen, firemen, teachers, whatever. And you go to them and say, where have you sold insurance? And they're calling you up complaining and they're saying, we don't even have a dentist. There's no dentist that takes Delta. They'll tell you every town. You hear these big PPO negotiators that can negotiate a higher PPO price for, you know, you give me your PPOs and they'll call them. Yeah, that doesn't happen when you're at 6200 South McClintock. That happens when you're in a town where there's only two providers and the consultant saying, you know, he's he's thinking about dropping that plan because his overhead is this, and he and they're like, no, we don't want him dropping that. He's plan. The only dentist. So so you or, have leverage, or, or, or maybe oh, yeah, or maybe the only dentist, or maybe only two or three. Sure. Whereas on sixty two hundred South McClintock, they all all thirty take it. So so going to your Delta Dental, going to your Connecticut General, going working the value chain backwards, saying. Where do you guys have patients with insurance and there's no need? This is what Heartland did. Mm. Rick Workman took that page right out of Sam Walton. Sam Walton and his wife, Helen, they sat around and they go, there's basically two Americas. Because Sears, Gibson, and TGNY, they won't go in any town that's under 250000 So the rural people, we're just supposed to be happy with a catalog. We just right. get a catalog with pictures. We're not good enough to actually get a store where we can see the merchandise. And Sears was making bank off their catalog. And, and Sam Walton said, well, if they're never going to go to Bentonville, town of 5,000, I'll, I'll risk the whole family business because I don't think anybody ever thinks they're going to sell to us direct. So, right. so, so Rick Workman, he was in a dozen states. I mean, he started in Effingham, Illinois. You know where that is? It's middle out the of middle Epping, of nowhere. Epping nowhere. I mean, it, it just, and that's what he did. He was always in all these small towns. So to go to – so then another thing you do, go to Patterson, Shine, Benko, Burkhart, and just ask him real simple. Where are all your over 30, over 60, over 90, over 120, and defaults and bankruptcies? And in my town, they'll say, oh, that's North Scottsdale. It's all in North Scottsdale. There's so nobody explain, other than that. Explaining that, so you're saying going to the supply companies – Asking them 
Where are your dentists their bills? who aren't paying their bills? Yeah, and they'll say, I got dentists in, in Scottsdale that, you know, every every month someone uh, or every quarter someone uh, bankrupts. A lot of them are behind 30, 60, 90 days. Then do you ask to reverse that? Where are you adding operatories? Where are you going into a for practice and, and adding out? And they'll say, oh, that's in Maricopa. That's in Eloy. That's in Florence. That's in blah, 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 blah. And they'll – so those guys, they, 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 they know their territory. They know – where it's needed. But a lot of dentists mix up because they'll, they'll go to Eloy and they'll say, well, how are these? These are all poor Mexican people. Yeah. And they all want their teeth fixed and they pay cash. And the dentist up the street from him is doing a million dollars a year. And the Patterson guy knows that. Right. And then they say, okay, so does they know that if supplies are 5% of your cost, that every dollar you, that they, that you give them, times 20 is your production that they, they, they you know they, they know what everybody's doing they'll say yeah you think that's a poor area everybody in that area is doing one to two million dollars a year and they're all expanding and well, then and you, you could probably do the same thing with a lab go ask the lab the same question and they'll tell you the same thing yeah and and you remember what i said a fool and their money will soon be parted sure. the biggest problem in north scottsdale is the people aren't going to pay their bills or they're going to pay them late uh, I remember I was talking to this very famous uh, Beverly Hills cosmetic dentist, and I was talking about his most famous patients, and he was telling me how they were the they were the latest payers. No and way. That's why they're so rich. So so in my 30 years in Phoenix, 25% of my practice has been from Guadalupe. I've never had a collection problem from Guadalupe, and they have dirt floors, and they're poor, and they all push sure. lawnmowers and do retail and run dishwashers, and they're the happiest people, and they pay all their bills. And then by the time you own four restaurants and live in an equestrian center and come to my office in a Mercedes Benz, and it takes, you know, so, so yeah, so don't, so work your value chain, work your suppliers, work your distributors, work Benco, Patterson, Burkhart, work the insurance company. And by the way, when you walk into the insurance company, can I say one thing about the insurance company? Yeah. A lot of dentists, they always go ballistic because the insurance company uh, denied one of their claims. Okay. First time I ever got a denied claim by Delta, it was uh, for, uh, um, it didn't even matter what it was, but it's for a preventative resin restoration on a bicuspid. Okay. They denied the claim. So here's my down home Kansas instinct. So the guy's name was Ed Judd. He was the executive director of Delta Dental. So I called up and said, Can I talk to Ed Judd? Well, their whole mentality is that they're afraid of the dentist because here they sell millions of dollars of insurance and, and the dentist treat them like shit. But then you give the American Dental Association a thousand dollars and they've never sold one dollar of insurance claim in their life. So it's like, why do you worship the ADA and pay them a thousand? We give you a hundred thousand dollars a year and you treat us like crap. And at your dental association meetings, you bring in speakers like Bill Dickerson where the course of the title would be Delta, the devil. And it's like, Delta's like, are you kidding me? We sell a billion dollars of dental insurance and our state dental society call, has courses called Delta or the devil. Right. And then build it, and it just people, dentists are batshit crazy. And so I, so I said, I, call him, I, said, well, I just want to talk to him. And um, they said, well, what is this regarding? I said, it's regarding that I'm a 25 year old dentist and he gives me like thousands of dollars every week. And I, I just want to, I just want to meet him. And, and he's still, he's still, uh, he said, well, he'll call you back. So it was like a week later, this guy called me back, Ed Judd, and he says, yeah, yeah what, what is this regarding? I said, what it's regarding is, you know, I'm getting all these Delta checks. You're subsidizing a lot of my patients' dentistry, and I, I want to take you to lunch. I said, what, what's your favorite restaurant? And this is before your time. It was called Black Eyed Peas. Do you remember okay. that? Do you remember no. that restaurant? No. And they sold uh, chicken fried steak, potatoes, gravy. I said, what's your favorite restaurant? He said, Black Eyed Peas. I said, that's mine too. I said, which one? There's like four up in Phoenix. He, and anyway, so he said the one. It was over on baseline. We met there for lunch. We had lunch. He was from Missouri. I ended up going to dental school in Missouri. He retired out there. He used to be the Delta guy at Missouri. Anyway, we just had the most fun hour, and we're walking out the door. He says, uh, so was, was there anything in your mind? I said, well, there was this claim that they denied. It was a preventive restoration on a bicuspid. They only claimed on molars, and uh, I, 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 I didn't get it. I mean, I'm happy with everything you're covering, but I, I, just, I just didn't know why. And he goes, well, what, what exactly is that? And I said, well, come back to the office, and I'll show you. So I, we drive back to the office, and he's like a 65-year-old man. I get a camera. I get the intro camera. He had a bicuspid just like it. No shot. I took microair abrasion. I said, see that spot there? The bugs live there where there's no oxygen. They only live in between the teeth. The floss gets those. But what I do, and then I sprayed that out. And by the time I sprayed out, he had a, a deep hole. 
I'm, I'm, I'm probably violating every HIPAA violation you all know that. <laughs> and then I sit there, acid ads, put on the resin composite, cured it, polished it, and, he's, and he jumped out of the chair. He goes, damn, Howie, that's cooler than shit. I never got a denied claim again uh, ever since then. And every then when he had other weird stuff that was going on, he'd say, hey, you want to go? I'll buy you lunch. And then we go to lunch. We talk and everything. Then he'd say, well, what do you think about this or that? And so, so the bottom line is I always treated everybody in the value chain with respect. I'm not going to have some Patterson lady standing there in the waiting room for an hour. That's just rude. Right. I'm not rude. When she comes in, they'll say, well, he's in a room. You want to come back or I'll schedule you a time like an appointment. Uh, I treated all the value chain just like I would a patient. They always gave me world-class information. They all helped me. We're all in this together. Again, our problem is discretionary income going to iPhones, vacations, and new Japanese cars. It's right. not Benko and Burkhardt and Delta Dental. These are all your homies, and we work in the food chain of dentistry. And the more friends you have and the better you treat your whole value chain, you're going to get better information faster, cheaper, lower in cost, higher in quality, and you're going to have a rocking hot fun career. Awesome. Well, that's, that's exactly what I wanted to hear today. And hearing you talk about ownership is still worth it, and if you want to get there, Get there as soon as possible. If straight out of school, if you can go for it, go for it. And if not, and you're going to have to find an associateship, make that count by working with someone you like to work with. You can learn from, you can expand the scope of your practice. If you're going to do something in, in Heartland or somewhere corporate, learn as much as you can and then expand the scope of your practice. And then when you're looking for somewhere to buy or even for an associateship, um, Go work that value chain, build relationships with labs, with insurance, with um, labs, insurance, what was the other one, supplies, and, and work backwards to figure out where you're needed rather than taking, you know, what, what, where does my family want to live and, and then not being able to produce in, in Scottsdale, go work in Awatuki or Maricopa and, and live like you want to live rather than, than struggling. What is it you say, uh, work with the masses so you can eat with the classes? Or So, Howard, I, I really thank you for, for your time today, for everything you do for dentistry. And you said earlier that, that I could have you back for every season of, of this podcast, and I fully intend because it's, it's going to be a business-only podcast where we're talking about this journey and, and I know you've got stuff to talk about every single point along the way. And especially now after having interviewed 500 people, you've got even more that, that you've got in your, your quiver of ammunition that you can just spout off this, that, and the other. So I really appreciate all your time and, and help. Well, I think the world, dude, can I, can I tell two more quick stories though? Yes, absolutely. Two more quick stories. You know what the best Crown and Bridge class I ever made, it's ever took in my life? What's that? Um, again, if you talk to any lab man, and I know a gazillion lab owners, you know, and they're afraid of their dentist because if they tell you that you know, something's wrong, you'll get pissed off and you'll send it to another lab. So they just try to work around this shit. So I sent my first impression or whatever, and this is way back in the day. I don't, I don't even know if he's alive. I doubt it. He was old back then. His name was Wolfgang. He was a German master ceramist, and everybody told me. I think it was continental or whatever i sent to wolfgang so after about i thought you know it's a two-week turn down. i'll call him after a week and so i call him after a week and i got him on the phone he's this very old german man and i said i said wolfgang i said this is howard i said i sent you my first impression i i'm just wondering i went to the university of missouri uc dentist from ucla uap i said was, was mine good and it was just this deep pause mm. he goes well uh you know, uh, what, what do you want me to say? I said, well, what, what was it good? <laughs> and he said, uh, you know, young man, you, you need to come down here. And he and I said, wait, what do you want me to come down? And so he told me. I went down there. He's showing me like 300 impacts. Mine was the worst prep he'd ever seen. He's showing me I didn't have enough reduction, this, that. He was telling me which ones were the best. Then he was making phone calls to those dentists. And some of them were like 65 years old in Scottsdale and saying, hey, you know, could you show this guy and blah, 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 blah. And then I was meeting that guy because I was – so, again, humility, 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 humility. Call him up. Make your friends working the value chain. Wolfgang sped my crown and bridge career up years just by taking me under his wing, and 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 he felt safe 
to tell me every time I was crazy and how I could do it better. Number two, when you set up that practice in a small town, you think, well, I don't know if I want to live in this small town for 40 years. Yeah, don't push a lawnmower 40 years. Get that thing up and running, making bank, and then put an associate in there, and then you can move to North Scottsdale. Right. No, absolutely. And, and that's the other thing is that any of these things, just like I'm doing the military temporarily for – six years, I'm, I'm doing a residency, and then I can get out if I want to. Um, you say it's kind of the same thing. Rather than going on a ship in the Navy in the middle of the ocean for, for four, four or six years or whatever, go somewhere in the middle of America where you can still have all of your stuff that you want, have the freedom that you want, but work in a small town for a period of time. It doesn't have to be your whole career, and, and work yourself out of that, that hole of debt and build up those skills and, and all of that while you still can. So awesome. Thank you so much, Howard. I love this. This is great. I'm looking forward to do some more. Anytime, buddy. Thank you for all you did for me, for Dental Town, for my podcast. I mean, I just, I just think the world of you. I just think you're the most rocking out all American Boy Scout dentist I've ever known. Oh, thank you, Howard. We're gonna have a lot of fun. All right, buddy. Have a good day. Bye, bye. You too. See. Ya.